were one of the uh, 16 scientists who met it this July at Altenburg at uh, Conrad Lorenz Institute to talk about reformulating the uh, theory of evolution based on natural selection. Is the uh, extended evolutionary synthesis now uh, a reality following the uh, Altenburg meeting? Yes, I would say it's a reality, um, not just following the Altenburg meeting, but people who were there and others who weren't there have been working on um, extending the breadth of the um, evolutionary synthesis for some time from a number of perspectives. And uh, I think that this meeting is just uh, a confirmation uh, that it's underway and perhaps uh, an impetus to push it forward even more. Uh, the extended uh, synthesis has been described as a graft onto the modern synthesis, the neo-Darwinian theory of evolution. Uh, while your final report is to be published next year by MIT, is it uh, the plan in the interim to cast um, a net globally for uh, scientific perspectives on the extended synthesis? Because as it stands now, the extended synthesis is largely an American, uh, European concept. Yes, I know um, people in India and Japan who are working very much along these lines and extending the synthesis. Um, so I think that um, we're all in touch with our international colleagues and um, I don't think that it really is confined to just the US and Europe. Is the modern synthesis, the neo-Darwinian theory of evolution, now history? Uh, so that um, public money being spent on research based on uh, the uh, modern synthesis is may in fact be wasted? Um, I wouldn't put it that way. I think that um, uh, up until fairly recently, um, uh, what's called the modern synthesis has been the only game in town. And I don't think that anybody at our meeting or any um, uh, people working in evolutionary theory, maybe there, were, there would be some that would say that the phenomena and mechanisms um, described in the modern synthesis don't pertain anymore. They, they do pertain. The question is, um, are they um, the major forces of evolution? Are they somewhat subordinate? Um, and you have a wide spectrum of opinion, even within our group of 16, as to whether the mechanisms of the modern synthesis are the predominant mechanisms or they're the subordinate me mechanisms. Um, how much uh, agreement is there among uh, your uh, Altenburg colleagues about the gene arriving late in the evolutionary process and playing a secondary role? So I think possibly some things that that uh, I've said uh, or have been quoted as saying or uh, interpretations of things that I've said or possibly some other people have um, put it in that light that the gene is a late arrival. But we never in our scientific papers have said anything like that. Um, we're all dealing with organisms um, that have genes. Even uh, before there were single, uh, multicellular organisms, mm -hmm. there were single-celled organisms with um, more than a billion years of evolution behind them in which genetic mechanisms have, were refined and, and established. and. Um, so there's prebiotic evolution that led to single cells that had genes. But once we reached the multicellular world, which is uh, maybe half a billion years ago or, or more, but um, not a very long time relative to the entire history of cellular life, once we hit that stage, we were very much dealing with organisms with genes. The question is, um, has all of the complex forms that have emerged since that point, since uh, multicellularity, are they dependent solely on genetic mechanisms or is it genetic mechanisms plus other determinants of morphogenesis, of the, the generation of form? So I don't know of anybody that um, thinks that genes arrive late, but perhaps genetic consolidation of patterns and forms um, trail after the uh, origination of the patterns and forms. Um, with the extended uh, synthesis, has a shift um, actually begun from the gene-centered perspective of evolution to non-centrality of the gene? So the question is what, dealing with 
I mean, as a result of this meeting, has, yes. has the shift happened? Well, there is, in some people's minds, the shift happened a while ago in their own work. Um, the general shift um, has not happened, and it may not happen for quite some time if it happens at all. But, um, but let me just put it in a more precise way. So it's not a shift from uh, mechanisms that use genes to mechanisms that don't use genes. All the mechanisms use genes, but the question is, um, are the differences between different forms um, solely due to genetic evolution, or are they due to um, other um, uh, organizing processes of, um, of multicellular life uh, beyond the gene, plus the gene? What do you think the origin of the gene is? Well, the origin of, um, of the gene is it's a, just a, it's one area that's very poorly understood in, uh, uh, in evolutionary biology. And, and here we're talking about what's called prebiotic evolution, evolution that preceded cells as we know it, because um, all cells that we know use genes as their um, hereditary mechanism. Um, there was... Um, a period in uh, early cellular life, and this has been written about by a scientist named Carl Woese, where um, he believes that genes were exchanged very freely between organisms. So he, he calls this a, a pre-Darwinian world where um, that basically uh, organisms take on new genetic characteristics, not through um, what's called vertical transmission, but by horizontal transmission from sharing with other organisms. But if you go back even before then, where did the gene come from? Um, some people suggest that there was a world of, uh, of RNA uh, that preceded the world of DNA, and that RNA was the most primitive uh, uh, genetic mechanism. Um, so you might have RNA genes preceding DNA genes, but where did the RNA genes come from? Um, then there's the you get into the area that's called chemical evolution. There are processes in uh, non-living systems that could potentially generate the molecules of living systems. And there are theories of thermal vents uh, under the ocean where there's a very extensive uh, chemical shuffling and reactions and things that could potentially generate these building blocks of life. But um, I've been to meetings that, where this is discussed and I've had some very smart people are at work in this area, but um, there's still uh, big gaps in our understanding. Uh, the term punctuated evolution is part of the uh, new uh, extended synthesis language. H how does it differ from the Eldridge Gould concept of punctuated uh, equilibrium, which argues that uh, evolution has not been a gradual process uh, as reflected in the fossil record? Yeah, so this is um, it's a somewhat controversial area because it, it involves, um, um, first of all, um, estimations of time scales. When um, Gould and Eldridge first presented their idea of punctuated equilibrium, they were just pointing to the fossil record and saying that um, things that were considered gaps in the fossil record because there were discontinuities in the forms that were uncovered might not truly be gaps. Things may have happened relatively fast, and therefore one form supplanted another form um, by um, uh, uh, evolutionary processes that were not entirely gradual. Okay. Now, um, then there was a kind of, um, over the years, I would say, kind of a backing off from considering what, what um, uh, evolutionary biologists would call saltational mechanisms, which are true, true jumps, um, so that you have one form uh, being uh, replaced by another form very rapidly. Gould and Eldridge would both talk about um, uh, rapid in a geological sense. So they were talking about um, millions of 